My point here is that bad entries can be salvaged, but bad exits can't. When you have a bad entry, you can always work your way around it. You can trim down the risk and so on and so forth. But when you have a bad exit, this is final. This is when the p gets printed. Entry is a choice. Exit is a necessity. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome back to another episode of the Better System Trader podcast. Glad you could join us today for what could be one of the most humorous chats we've had so far. Now, I just want to start today by repeating a small bit of that opening audio that we just heard because it sets it up quite nicely for today's chat. When you have a bad entry, you can always work your way around it. But when you have a bad exit, this is final. This is when the P&L gets printed. Exits have such a dramatic impact on overall strategy performance, so having a full and proper understanding of the best way to leverage exits is absolutely essential. Now, in this episode, Laurent Bernou from Alpha Secure Capital combines his witty sense of humour with his knowledge of exits to entertain and to also share some insights, including how to classify exits and set them to achieve much clearer, neater and better trading strategies. He also shares with us a simple technique to determine if we've overstayed our welcome in a trade, how to use the game of two-thirds to determine the length of a time exit, plus much more, including the correct way to think about stop losses, how to deal with freeloaders in a portfolio, and the ultimate entry technique to test you have a robust exit strategy. So let's jump in now to our chat with Lauren. Lauren Bernier, welcome back, my friend. This is the third time you've been on the show now, right? Yeah, thank you very much for having me back, Andrew. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, you've been invited back on the show because of a response to one of the previous podcast episodes. But uh, before we get into that, how about a very brief introduction of yourself for those who may not be so uh, familiar? So what's your trading background? Oh, uh, I've been uh, I've been a specialist on the Japanese equities since uh, 2001. So prior to that, I was an accountant at a Japanese company. Then in 2001, I joined the sales side. Then I went to the hedge fund world. I did a couple of hedge funds. And in 2007, I thought the game was too easy. So, uh, I mean, I joined Fidelity. I joined as a dedicated short seller. So for the next eight years, my mandate as a short seller was to underperform the worst bear market in history. And now I do algorithmic trading, uh, primarily on, on Forex and also on other asset classes. And uh, we do it for ourselves. Um, that's yep. about it. Okay, awesome. So as I mentioned um, earlier, I invited you back on the show because, um, well, you heard the, the podcast episode I released, I think maybe about a month or so ago now, called Choosing mm-hmm. the Right Type of Exit. And uh, you sent me an email response uh, to that podcast episode, which raised a number of interesting points. So I thought um, maybe we should record this so that others can hear it too. Now, I I won't play the audio from that previous podcast episode again, but if people want to hear that, they can go back to episode 77. But the main gist of of that episode was that exits should be paired with certain entries. So When you look at stops, you consider the entry method and uh, how long the entry method is predictive and gauge the stops from there. So what is your take on this type of approach? My short answer to that is 53%. (laughs) Yes. As the great American philosopher used to say, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth. That's Mike Tyson there. Like we all have a plan. Everything looks fantastic when we get in, but 53% stands for the divorce rate. And nobody walks into marriage thinking that that they're going to divorce one day. Now, if you don't think about how you're going to divorce first, that's going to be a very costly choice down the road. Look at Rod Stewart and everybody else. So my point here is that bad entries can be salvaged, but bad exits can't. Entry is a choice. Exit is a necessity. So as a short seller, 
the problem that you have on the short side is that you have to face volatility, short squeeze, and so on and so forth. So it's actually very difficult. And when you have a bad entry, you can always work your way around it. You can trim down the risk and so on and so forth. But when you have a bad exit, this is final. This is when the PL gets printed. Now, another number is 90%. 90% of market participants think that making money in the stock market is about stock picking and entry. Now, another 90% fails in the market. That's called correlation, if not causality. So if you start with the end in mind, it makes it easier. And actually, a few years ago, like I read this thing about, oh, you can't write the book of, uh, you can't write the book of exit if you don't write the book of entries first. And also I heard w one person on, the, on your podcast, and this comes, as a, this comes from a place of humility. I, re I highly respect and regard this person, or this person in high regard. But at the same time, coming from the short side, it offers a different perspective. So if I could offer my two cents or maybe a cent and a half, something like this. <laughs> the idea there is actually, if you start with the, uh, with the exit, then it fashions a different sort of entry. Let's, let's get a very simple example, like people who trade breakouts, for instance. People who trade breakout, breakout of usually about between 30 to 30, early 30 to mid 30 uh, win rate. Now, Let's say, for instance, you trade, instead of trading and you have a trailing stop loss about like 280 hours or whatnot. Now, instead of trading the breakout, if you went a bit earlier on when you traded when just about this stock is about to start to go up and you still have the same exit to ATR, then it would be a much better probability of success. So the idea is by actually setting the stop loss or the exit, then calculating the entry becomes a sliding scale probability. It becomes an easier probabilistic game. So the corollary to that, the, the logical conclusion to that is that instead of having like 25 entry strategies, by setting exits, in in, by classifying exits and setting them in terms of classification, then you have much clearer, neater, and better strategies altogether. That was my point, basically. Okay, can we just talk about this a little bit further then? Because um, you, you've just said that um, we should start with the end in mind and work back to the beginning, and you gave us a, a little bit of an example there with a, a breakout strategy. But can you can you give us a little bit more information on the actual process that a trader would um, follow to to determine the the best approach there? All right. So there are basically two types of strategies. There are only two. And the way they're determined is actually surprisingly is because of the exit. The two types of strategies are mean reversion on the one hand and trend following on the other. And the reason why actually there are only two types of strategies is because of the, the shape of the distribution curve of the profit, the PL is determined by the exit. Let's say, for instance, you buy deep value and then it goes back to the mean and then you close it right there. Boom. Okay. That's mean reversion. So every now and then you buy devalue, 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 and it becomes value trap. Oh, and it keeps on going down and down and down. But but at that time it seemed like a good idea. Yeah, well. <laughs> 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 on the other hand, with the same uh, value stuff, then you buy like Apple at two dollar share. Actually, I know a friend of mine. He bought uh, Apple at two dollars a share. He was working for Microsoft back then. So Bill Gates is buying a uh, Apple at two dollars a share. Bill Gates is a smart guy by any standard. I'm going to do the same thing. Now the guy is like, is, is retired, is retired like multiple times. But the idea is like, if you buy deep value of whatever value, and then once it passes the means and it goes on and you let it carry over, then it becomes trend following. So the point there is that actually your exit will determine the type of strategy that you're trading. Hmm. And uh, also, if we look in terms of uh, classifying exits, I mean, the difficulty that people have is uh, the, one of the, uh, I was answering something on Quora, like what's the problem that all traders face and so on and so forth. The main problem that traders face is that they don't have an exit plan. So in warfare, the only type of people who go out across, behind enemy lines and blow up stuff and so on and so forth and don't think about an exit plan are called kamikaze. Hmm. Now, not entirely sure that you want to that you want to adopt this as your trading style. <laughs> <laughs> so, the whole idea is if you have an exit plan before, and and I can give you a very precise example of when it happened to me. 
very precise example. When I was working, uh, I used to work at Fidelity. When I was working at Fidelity, I made a I made a conscious decision one day to switch from discretionary to semi-discretionary, and then eventually 100% systematic. Now I'm 100% systematic. To me, being a systematic trader is like being pregnant. Either you are, either you're not. You can't really impregnate yourself for Tuesday night because it's ladies' night and cheap drinks are cheaper. That doesn't work <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> here we go. So one day, actually, um, I, I developed this thing called the box concept, and we're going and uh, we're going to go deeper into this. But the whole idea is, once you're locked into the trap, either you have a stop loss if you're on the long side, either you have a stop loss, it goes down, and you have a stop loss. Either there's a time limit to anything, like yeah, I got into this and it's not really working. I keep on sponsoring, uh, taking a. Uh, whining and dining and nothing's happening, not even the first case. All right, time out, next. Otherwise, there's like a risk reduction. This is something we should explore because this is something that really tilts the the, the, trade, the gain expectancy or trading edge. So either way, there are three basically uh, booby traps. And then I realized that everybody's got a portfolio. And as a short seller, it's an extremely stressful place to be. But when I, what I realized is that actually the thing that I was looking after because all the exits were planned for, it really was t- it was very liberating. I didn't have to stress about anything. I knew that whatever condition would happen, something would be triggered. So until then, I didn't have to do anything. And it was really a conscious, liberating decision. My stress was totally lifted compared to all my colleagues who had like, their sectors to look after and what not. They had fewer stocks to look after and they were supposedly on the right direction because being long is, is probably easier. But they were stressful. They were more stressed stressed out. They were glued to the news flow. They were, they were always on the lookout for anything happening. And it brings like subconscious stress. Whereas I was so bored then I started looking back on YouTube and looking at Shaolin flicks. So it was kind of hilarious. Like I, re- I remember watching those Shaolin flicks and my uh, and my boss walking in like, well, well, like like Bruce Lee noises. Like, dude, you are watching a Shaolin flick again? Like I'm looking at him like, dude, you're not. <laughs> 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 and it was hilarious. Like everybody were rolling their eyes where they were swinging by. They were hearing Shaolin flicks. But the whole thing is. The, the very important takeaway is that if you think about your exits first and if you enshrine them, if you box them, what's going to happen across your portfolio is that until anything happens, you don't have to stress about it. Mm. So it frees up a lot of mental bandwidth. And mental bandwidth is something you need in stressful time. Now, what we can do is basically look into the, the types of exits that we should be looking for. What do you think? That sounds good because you, you made a statement earlier, actually, which I was going to ask about next, where you said that market participants rarely think about exits logically. So maybe we can um, break these type of exits down and have a discussion about each, if you like. Okay, sure. So number one is stop loss. Yeah. Yeah, stop loss is a vastly misunderstood topic. Vastly misunderstood. I mean, uh, wow. First of all, nobody likes stop loss. Nobody, I mean, nobody likes to talk about stop loss and so on and so forth. Like, even for instance, I work with uh, discretionary fundamental people, and like, no, nah, don't, don't mention stop loss because it's actually the psychology of stop loss. And there's something in my website about this. The psychology of stop loss is very important. Uh, we can talk about this, and this is an entirely different topic altogether. But the psychology of stop loss is we associate mentally being right with being profitable. Like, oh, you, you, you were right about that stock. It means, okay, you made money. Which the opposite is, oh, it lost money. Therefore, you were wrong. So your ego will fight it. Best example, Valiant Bill Ackman. That thing, I mean, uh, that thing, it has soft patch, I think, from 250 down to 22, a bit of a soft patch. And right around 150, he bought some more, which basically says that ego superseded his process. Now, the way to think about stop loss is to think in terms of process. Like, okay, it might lose or make money, it doesn't really matter. But as long as I adhere to the process, I have a process that tells me, okay, this is a stop loss and I need to execute it. And being right is about execution. Sometimes I might be on the right side, sometimes I might be on the wrong side. But overall, over time, it's the right thing to do. 
And for that, I mean, there's a whole process. So there's a, there's a post on my website about this. But to clarify things about stop loss, another thing that is important is that stop loss should be logical. Like, the, uh, let me give you a contrario example is uh, the turtles. The turtles had a breakout and then they had a 2.5 ATR stop loss behind it, which is good. It makes sense from a risk management perspective, but it's disrespectful of the market. As in, like, market doesn't really care about 2.5 ATR. What it really cares is where it settled and where it rallied from. So that makes sense. So thinking about stop losses in logical terms rather than risk management avoids the whipsaws. Remember, the whole, the whole idea of making money is about tilting the, the peak of trades. And if you can switch from near wins to near misses, as in like small losses to small wins, then you win a lot. Now, another thing also about stop losses, uh, the way... Uh, Cool way to think about it, something that will dissipate the, 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 the emotional attachment is to think about breaks. I can give you the, the keys to the sexiest Ferrari and Lamborghini and whatever and whatnot. And I promise you that you will never set foot in the car if I just tell you, yeah, yeah, give you the car. Don't worry. Uh, but the brakes are a bit spongy, you know? You're going to be like, all <laughs> oh, right, where's the next taxi cab? <laughs> <laughs> Uber, come around here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that's stop loss. Now, the next thing is uh, risk reduction. Yeah. Now, this is something that I learned on the short side. On the short side, you see, like, as Einstein said, there are three certainties in life. There's death, there's taxes, and then there's short squeeze. I'm not sure, actually, Einstein mentioned that one, but he was probably <laughs> thinking about it. Anyhow, <laughs> so, <laughs> short squeeze is basically, like, something that can transform the deep, rich voice of baritone voice of Barry White to the high falsetto voice of Barry Gibbs. Both Barrys, very different. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can relate with that. But the whole idea of risk reduction is on the short side, market tanks and then it rebounds. And then, it, and then this is where it gets really stressful. So one way to approach the short side is to take risk off the table before you see the the short squeeze so that it will flush away the tourist. You can weather it. And then once the short squeeze rolls over, you can step back in and floor it again. Now, the, the, the implication for people who trade long and short is that the market is not a one-way street. It's not like it's not all in and all out. It can be in, a little bit out. It tanks, thank you very much. Get back in and so on and so forth. So it's a succession. And what happens when you do that is that actually you reduce the risk each time. Every time you add to a position, you add risk. Every time you take away with a little profit, you reduce the risk. Now, this work only in conjunction with stacking positions because the algebra behind it for gain expectancy says that actually if you just take money away and just let it run, mathematically, the stop loss will be at a disadvantage. You will lose more than you will win over time. So it makes sense to actually take money off the table and get back in. Once you're, the risk is in your favor, get back in and so on and so forth. So risk reduction is really what tilts the, the gain expectancy, the algebra behind it. Yeah. Okay. So another type of exit that you mentioned uh, briefly earlier is the time exit. So how should people think about a time exit? Oh, the idea is very simple. Like, Let's take another metaphor. I mean, if you own a building or if you own an apartment, would you allow your tenants to stay rent-free? No. Most people would say no. Okay. That was very clear. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no to self. Never sublet from Andrew. <laughs> 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 oh man uh, coming back to this analogy like if you own basically a building you would never allow tenants to stay rent free right these are freeloaders but this happens over and over and over in the portfolios of everybody like and I'll tell you how it happens let's say for instance you got into a stock this thing roofed it it worked really well and then for uh, like maybe the three, the last three to six months, it just, I mean, it doesn't do anything. It just goes sideways, doesn't do anything. Like, okay, fine. You still, mentally, you're still, okay, this was a great contributor. I don't know what's going to happen. Or you don't even think about it. Like you realize that you look at the embedded p &L, like, wow, this has been great. But meanwhile, okay, this was last year's trade. So how to deal with it is basically 
the, and I have a post about it. It's actually a fairly simple algebraic way to look at it. Like, okay, if for one third of your turnover, that thing hasn't done anything, just halve the position. Half the position. And then reallocate to something that a new idea or something that is working so that it fluidifies the portfolio. And to sort of, to sort of, to cement and solidify the argument, what I realized when I was uh, when I was working with other managers is that a lot of people actually uh, underperform the, the market, but for two reasons. Everybody believes, oh, that when there's a big blow up, you're dead. Yeah, there's some of it, but also there are also those freeloaders that did well before, but they don't carry their weight. So whenever there's some there's an accident happening, it just drags performance altogether. So by basically recycling money, recycling assets to the ones that are working, then you fluidify the portfolio and you're actually solidifying it. So time exit in this sense is very important. If it or if you got into something and it hasn't worked like a couple of months down the road and it's still like, oh, but I can't time the market and so on and so forth. Fine, have it for now. When it starts working, replenish it. You can't really afford it if you're professional. No, I don't I can't really time the market. Well then if you don't want to do that, do something else. Mm. And the final one is the final exit. Now that is a difficult one. Because the hardest part is to know when to say goodbye. And that is very, very difficult. A lot of people actually overstay their welcome. I mean, look at, for instance, people who were in gold in 2012 and so on and so forth. People who were in internet in 1999. They rode them on the way up, rode them on the way down. It's actually kind of difficult. When should you just take money off the table as opposed to when should you get out for good? And that is. That is not an easy one. And for this, I have a very simple technique. I'm, I'm writing a book about short selling and I'm writing a book about the setup. Like people have this vision of, oh, this is either technical, this is either fundamental. It's like two different religions. They all pray to the same God, but they have different religions and a different approach to it. And my belief is that actually sometimes being a bit technical works and sometimes adding fundamental to technical works and vice versa. It's more of a syncretism, like work together rather than work in a position. And I have a very, very simple way to look at it. How, how do we know that the market has moved on the other side is we look at flow, something that we call floor and ceiling. Let's say, for instance, you're long and the market makes a high, then tax and then rallies back up and then the rally and at, settles at a lower price than the previous peak. It basically tells one thing, supply, demand. Mm. When the sellers were in charge, they pushed the price down a lot. And then when the buyers were back in charge, they pushed the price high, but not as high as it used to be. That tells you one thing, from now on, the sellers are in charge. So, all right, okay, fine, time to go. That's as simple as it gets. Mm. Who's in charge, the sellers or the buyers? If you're long and the sellers are going to be in charge, you're going to have a lot of hard days. You're going to have a lot of rationalization that you don't need to do. At the very least, halve the position. Just halve the position and see what happens next. If it continues to decline, next, next. Yep. So now, I just want to jump back to time exit for a minute. With the time exit, how do you actually quantify, though, how – long you should give it um so in the examples you were you were saying there that they were kind of more longer term trades i mean you can use time exits in short trades as well but how do you actually quantify the length of time that you should be looking for ah all right so uh, i i played this game called a game of two thirds so basically you look at uh, your your turnover annual turnover and then you divide it by three the idea behind dividing by three is that if you divide by two, it will be too slow moving. If you divide it by four, you might be a little disrespectful of the market. You know, like sometimes price goes up, then oof, takes a break, gets off the car, have a coke, go to the toilet, get read the newspaper, get back on the car, and so on and so forth. So it takes a bit of time. You need to be a bit respectful of the market. So divided by three is probably good statistical average. So you look, you divide your turnover by three. Let's say, for instance, your turnover is, I mean, let's say then you end up every quarter for whatever reason, okay, every quarter. Then you look at, you separate the performance in quartile. So you look at the third, the first and the fourth quartile will always be dealt with. Like 
the stuff that really clocks and the stuff that really hurts, you will always deal with them. The problem is that the freeloaders never stand out in the portfolio. They're neither here nor there. You think of them, yeah, well, you know, those guys, yeah, they're not really, they're not really contributing, but doesn't really hurt. So they're not, they're not hurting or contributing enough to be dealt with. So they're still thunder performers. They just pay half the rent, enough not to be kicked out. So you look at the third percentile and you divide it in the, so the third percentile over one third of the turnover. And then for every for all of these guys, you just halve the positions. No questions asked, halve the position. And then re redistribute it across the first and second quartile on new ideas. The whole idea is to bring what is stealth in the portfolio and to, to deal with them. And the only way to deal with them, because they're not exactly standing out, is to look on the x-axis, which is the time axis. And this is why you want to look at the one third of the turnover. Does it make sense? Yeah. So how can you apply this principle to shorter term trading, like swing trading over a couple of days? I don't know how to do that. Actually. Well, if it's over a couple of days, I mean, <laughs> swing trading. I mean, if it's that, if it's supposed to be there for a couple of days and it's been there for a couple of weeks, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you're saying an element of common sense. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Now, I just wanted to jump back to this box concept because I'm not sure I quite understood it uh, when you explained it earlier. So can you just run us through that again, how how that applies to exits? Oh, all right. Okay. So basically, you have, let's, let's take a simple example, something that people can relate to a long. You get into a long at 100. Now, uh, think of it like, let's say, for instance, you have 50 or 60. And actually, the interesting part about the box concept is like, Professional portfolio managers believe that they can't deal with like hundreds of positions. Wrong. If you apply the box concept, there's virtually no limitation to the number of positions you can deal with. So that's an important point. Like, let's say you get a hundred, you put a stop loss, I don't know, 95, somewhere like this, and then you put a partial exit at 105. So if the price tanks, you'd be stopped out. If price goes up, you'll trigger a partial exit. Like you just take risk off the table. Now, you have basically the up and down, but over time, the x-axis is always the most problematic. It's something that people don't think much about. So let's say it's been there for a couple of months or we use the same exercise that, I, that we talked about before. So what happens is that, okay, let's say your turnover is about three months. Okay, then you just let it run and it goes nowhere for a while. And after three months, boom, you have to make a decision. So no matter what happens, once the trap has snapped, once the stock is in, it has to be dealt with and it will be dealt with because you have set the plan before. The plan for exit is set in advance. So the box concept is basically beneath the price, you have a stop loss. Above the price, you have a risk reduction. Hmm. Now, there does seem to be a lack of study on the top of, of exits. And I think it's not something uh, that's really talked about too often. Uh, compared to entries anyway. So well, where can people go to learn more about exits or wh what do you think their approach should be to really dive into this area a lot more? Oh, okay. Um, I mean, the, the way I got started into exit is actually by starting to uh, code strategies. Like I was on Wealth Lab and I coded strategies and I realized like, wait a minute, I've been, I've been just like everybody else, like, oh, the standard like ATR trading stop loss and I realized, wait, this is primitive. And then when I started thinking about, okay, let's code them into uh, uh, like before stop loss, risk reduction, time exit, final exit, like those four basically. And risk reduction goes back into scaling out, scaling in. Then this is actually uh, hard to, to study about them. But as you say, there's very little work about it. And to come back to the to the roots of this is that People have the belief that, okay, you can't write the book of, of exit until you've finished the book of entries. So people work very hard on the book of entries and they never really give time to the book of exit. Maybe I should write about it. Actually, I should probably write something about stop loss a lot more. The good news is I'm writing a book on short selling. So um, in there, I talk a lot about exit. I talk about gain expectancy, trading edge, and I talk a lot about position sizing. So entries last and very least, like, you know, like guys like Tom Basso, like was one of the legendary traders. He, he had a like flipper coin entry. Now, flipper coin entry to me is the ultimate test that you have a very robust strategy. 
So yeah, thinking about this in terms of exit and classifying your exit is actually kind of very robust way to look at it. I don't know. It's my, my thinking. Okay, cool. Well, I look forward to um, you know, seeing your book when it's ready. So yeah, keep us updated on that one. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Now, um, so you know, I, I usually do the quick closing questions, but you've done that before because you've been on the podcast um, at other times. So what I might do for this one, since we're talking all about exits, I might twist these questions into the context of exits instead. So let's see if this works. I'm not sure in my mind it sounds like a good idea, but it might come out crap, but we'll try it anyway. So um, what's the biggest lesson you've learned through studying exits? Uh, two, two things. Number one is peaceful. Like once you set the, the exit plan, then it's peaceful. The, uh, there's a great book for that, which is The Hour Between the Dog and the Wolf. John Coates. So it's very peaceful. That's number one. And number two, your type of exits, and this is really important when we're talking deep strategy, your exits will determine your strategy, will determine your profitability. That's a very core point. Yep. Okay. Uh, what do you think is the most important ingredient to um, determining the best type of exits for your strategy? The thing is, it's always a combination of multiple exits. You can have one entry, but I mean, the market, I mean, the, the market throws randomness, so you need to be prepared for a whole bunch of randomness. So at the end of the day, I think there are two things there. No, number one is, for instance, if you have a stop loss that is too tight, you're going to have a very low win rate, but you're going to have a, a long erosion of like false positive or like tight stop losses. And there, there's, there are two things. There's the, the mathematical expectancy but at the same time, there's the comfort of the trader. Like, all right, I just cut like at 1.5 ETR and whatnot. Then you're gonna then you're gonna spend the whole day on the button. Whereas for your Strudy, for instance, okay, we just set it below the floor, and meanwhile I can go kite surf over there, and I don't have to worry much about it. What's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you or to learn more from you? I'm on Quora, so Q U O R A. I have uh, over a million views, which wow. never ceases to surprise me. And uh, so people can ask me questions over there. Otherwise, there's my website, alphasecurecapital.com. Uh, there's a whole body of uh, answers that I did on Quora. Apparently, I'm, the, I'm a, one of the top writers for finance. Oh, well done. Yeah, apparently. I'm trying to help people. Literally, actually, I literally genuinely want to help people. Yeah. So that's an awesome job. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not being sarcastic. It's, that's great. A million, a million views is, uh, that's, that's great. You're helping a lot of people. So keep it up. And um, so what about, um, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we finish up for today? Uh, well, um, the book is going to be released soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, if I can help your listeners, I think you're doing a spectacular job. Uh, I mean, yeah, Andrew, you're really doing a great job. Uh, one book I would recommend to all your listeners is uh, The Hour Between the Wolf and the, the Dog. It's a really good one. You are also talking about uh, peak peak performance expertise. Yes. That's uh, Anders Ericsson. It's, I, I'll, I'll talk a lot about it on the book. Another one that would be interesting would be Grit, Angela Duckworth, in the same vein. Grit, okay. And... Uh, that's really interesting. So I think that those books go together. Mm. That's about it. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Lauren. It was uh, as entertaining as always, and uh, it was great to hear your thoughts on exits as well. I think, um, as I mentioned before, I don't think it's uh, it's not a very popular topic, but it ha can have such a huge impact on our trading performance. So I think um, you know it's great to speak to people who've done a lot of study into that kind of thing and to share your knowledge. So yeah, really appreciate you spending the time with us today to um, to share those insights. So thanks again, and all the best, mate. I'll catch you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.